so to introduce myself, I'm Dr. Sarah Singleton from TASC. We are a think tank based in Dublin, and we conduct research and public um, outreach concerning um, inequality, climate justice, social inclusion, and also democracy. Um, TASC are one of the organizations um, in, in a consortium carrying out this project across the EU with other organizations from Spain, Italy, and Bulgaria and Poland. Um, in Ireland, we have um, actually very high trust in media. Um, a 2021 uh, Reuters survey also found that we have very high, we would rate ourselves as very highly interested in media and news as well. So 70% of people in that survey would have rated themselves as extremely interested in news, which is about 10% um, above the EU average. Um, we also don't have a very high percentage of people who are currently getting their news online which is about 83%, which is also about 10% above the EU average. Um, so we, I'll pass you on to my colleagues who will kind of give you a view of kind of their kind of particular jurisdiction as well. Um, so we're very happy there was a huge amount of interest in this event. So we had over 230 people registered for this event today. So I think it kind of shows how much of an issue it is um, of interest for people across the EU. Um, so some practical things first. Um, there's a chat function, so please feel free to add any comments or questions you have in the chat as we go or any links that you think would be useful. Um, I'll just kind of remind you all that this is being recorded. Of course, we can't see your faces because this is a webinar, but if you ask any questions, um, it's just that your name may be mentioned. I will also ask you if you would like to change your name on Zoom to your correct name and possibly organization if you want to be quoted um, during the question session as well. Um, so today, first of all, you'll hear about the Media Literacy uh, for Democracy project itself, um, before going on and hearing from some expert panelists in media literacy and disinformation. We'll then finish off with a Q&A session at the end. So to get us going, I'm going to pass you over to my colleague Eleonora Mongelli, and she is from FIDU. And FIDU is the um, Italian Federation for Human Rights, and they're the lead partner on this project. And Eleonora is going to give you an overview of the project and kind of its importance. Thank you, Sarah, and good morning, everyone. Yes, this is um, a project funded by the Citizen Equality Rights and Values Program of the European Union with, uh, with a focus on one of the six European Commission priority, a new push for European democracy, which means the protection of our democratic values, specifically our commitment to fundamental human rights, the protection of a free and independent press, upholding the rule of law and equality among citizens. This also means the protection of our democracy from external interference, such as disinformation. Today, as never before, as human rights defenders, we are witnessing the negative impact of this information campaign on democratic processes and on human rights in the world. This phenomenon can affect our freedom of thought and the right to democratic participation, undermining citizens' trust in democratic institutions not only distorting free and fair elections, but also fomenting digital violence and repression. Fighting this information also means defending uh, uh, free media, academia, and civil society, and as they should be put in a condition to play their role in stimulating open debate, free from malign interference, either foreign or domestic. So when it comes to counter disinformation, we think that it is extremely important to support at the same time, the protection of human rights. And that's why one of the core methodology of uh, media literacy for democracy project is the, the, the cross sector cooperation and the multidisciplinary approach. To tackle uh, this major challenge, uh, we need of course uh, uh, the expertise of media experts, journalists, and the disinformation experts. But uh, equally important uh, is the role played by experts of law, of social sciences, of human rights, uh, and of course, of civil society. We know well that this information affects uh, European countries uh, in different ways, uh, but we need to, um, to find a European and coordinated response. This response uh, includes regulations uh, 
um, corporate uh, measures uh, and civil society uh, action. And uh, with this project, we decided to start from civil society action. This information reach more people and penetrate deeper uh, if it finds uh, uh, fertile ground. An example uh, uh, could be uh, the fake news we can easily find related to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. It's very easy to find uh, uh, on the web, but also in traditional media, misleading and uh, made up information aimed at confusing the targeted community. This happens because of the low quality of journalism, but also because of the lack of education about the basics of online literacy. And in a recent study uh, on disinformation and propaganda's impact of the rule of law in the EU and its member states, published by the Special Committee of the European Parliament on Foreign Interference, it is stated that over the last three years, the impact of disinformation has changed. The research showed that disinformation actions more and more merge with genuine content and their sources become uh, even more difficult to identify. And when it comes to our response, there is a widespread awareness about the need to increase the critical media literacy among European citizens. It is crucial to inform citizens, uh, especially young people, about what mis misinformation and disinformation phenomena mean, and which uh, is their impact on the rule of law and on the European values. It is necessary to educate European citizens to make informed decisions and to promote their participation in the democratic and civic life on the of the Union. And media literacy for democracy focuses on the promotion of an effective and inclusive media literacy strategy based on the cross-sector cooperation, as I said before. The consortium is composed of six partners uh, from Italy, uh, Spain, Poland, Bulgaria, and uh, Ireland. And the action aims to be a follow-up of a previous project called Communication, uh, led by FIDU as well, under the program Europe for Citizens, and specifically starts from its survey report, according to which the vulnerability uh, to this information in the EU is often linked to the general lack of knowledge about our institutions, uh, how they work, uh, their role and their competencies. And to this purpose, uh, as, as first activity, uh, um, we have created an online booklet which explains what the misinformation and disinformation mean, their impact uh, on our society, uh, their response uh, um, the response of the institutions, in particular of the European Union, the role uh, of media, um, for example, we mentioned the new Euro European Media Freedom Act and other related topics. Our partner from Bulgaria uh, will tell us more uh, about uh, this, uh, this tool. And as I said before, uh, this information is affecting our countries in uh, different ways. And it is important to recognize how it works, who are the targets, which are the most vulnerable topics uh, uh, to these operations. And that's why the idea of this project started by a local analysis that each partner of the consortium made on the perception of misinformation and disinformation phenomena. And to better analyze the local situation and to better address the issue, we will implement five three days focus group uh, with participants from 18 to 35 years old to be held in the participating countries. And the results of these local events will be then used for the organization of the three international workshops uh, to be held in Italy, um, Poland and uh, Spain, where participants will have the opportunity to interact with the experts, but also to share their views, their expertise in a, in a European dimension. And after these events, uh, a set of policy recommendations addressed to institutions, to media workers, to um, 
to, to universities will be drafted and presented to a wide audience during our final conference, uh, uh, which will be held uh, in March 2024. Uh, with the goal to help define um, an effective uh, uh, European and inclusive uh, uh, strategy to promote media literacy uh, um, in member states. And uh, for the moment, I stop here and I leave the floor to our um, uh, partners and uh, our guests. Hey, thank you for, very much for that, Eleonora. Um, now I'm gonna pass you over to Maria. Um, uh, she's our partner from Bulgaria and she will introduce herself and also cover um, a book list guide that um, the project has made on media literacy. Thank you, Sarah. Hi everyone, my name is Maria Rajinska and I'm the co-founder of Foundation for Entrepreneurship, Culture and Education. FETI is a non-profit organization founded in 2014, based in Sofia, Bulgaria. Our work at FESTA mostly revolves around European and cultural topics. We also have a number of youth activities. We implement cultural events and educational projects. Our mission is to support, assist, and uh, promote the development of culture, education, innovation, science, and the entrepreneurial qualities of young people and those with fewer opportunities. FETA fosters freedom of cultural expression, promotes democracy and human rights, EU values, and active citizenship. We are actually very happy to be once again on board of a project coordinated by FIDU, as we have previously worked on the communication, the youth engagement for communicating the EU project. And through its realization, we have real realized how this information, fake news, and pro propaganda can have a very devastating effect on our communities and on our societies, and also the importance of creating a communication strategy to engage young people and citizens with the correct understanding of the EU, what it is and what it does, its values and its benefits, and also in empowering citizens to widen their civic participation and tackle disinformation. Now that we dive deeper into the disinformation phenomena, it's important to promote media literacy as a paramount in countering the spread of disinformation and protecting citizens' rights to truth. And here comes the Media Literacy for Democracy project, as mentioned already by Eleonora. The Media Literacy for Democracy project is promoting, uh, it's aimed at promoting an effective media strategy that aims to tackle disinformation and to empower citizens to make informed decisions and protect their democratic values. And now you're seeing on the screen, Sarah, can yeah. you share the booklet, please? Yes, thank you. Now you're seeing on the screen the very first product of this uh, project and, and of this media literacy strategy, which is a booklet aimed at informing citizens about the negative impact of disinformation on democratic societies and the importance of media literacy to build civic, to build civic society's capacity to adapt to the digital era and to protect democratic values. In order to navigate through this aware raising tool, the booklet, one should read it thoroughly and in an informative manner, as we're now entering a new era of rapidly evolving technology and an ever growing global interconnectedness. It has become increasingly difficult for people to differentiate between what is fact and what is fiction. The booklet covers topics such as what is disinformation and misinformation, their impact, and how we can combat them on individual, community, and European level. Also, what is media literacy, the role of media for democracy and civil society and participation in general. So the spread of disinformation and misinformation, as already mentioned before, is a threat to the European Union, not only to the European Union, but to Europe as a whole, and is a tangible concern to our democratic systems. The EU institutions put a lot of effort into various action plans, tools, and instruments that can help the fight against disinformation. Such important tools are, for instance, the communications, the, uh, the Commission's communication on tackling online disinformation, a European approach from 2018, the action plan against disinformation from the same year, the European Democracy Action Plan from 2022, and the newly introduced European Media Freedom Act from last year. All of these plans uh, have something in common, which is the coordinated response to fighting disinformation and the importance of raising awareness on strengthening democracy 
and democratic procedures across Europe. Moreover, the booklet touches upon the importance of the acquisition of media literacy and digital skills to answer to an ever changing and digitally transforming public spheres. Being able to think critically and analytically distinguish facts from false information is becoming indeed the skill of the 21st century. Training can also help individuals, young people, citizens to develop media literacy uh, skills which are needed to engage in public debates and in this way to help them make informed decisions on matters that affect their life. In addition, the forms of participation and engagement have also shifted, providing for new means of active citizenship and participation in democratic processes. Young people can now participate and have their voices heard through different European platforms and initiatives, and in this way, engage in public debates and make informed decisions on the matters that affect their lives and their communities. Lastly, I would like to welcome you all to uh, look and read the booklet on FIDU's uh, official website in the dedicated section of the Media Literacy for Democracy project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria. And um, after this event, I will, we will share this document with you as well by email. Um, I'm going to pass you over now to Inez, uh, Inez Ferreros from, uh, from Fundación Alternativas to introduce herself. So you're on mute there, Inez. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Sara, for the introduction. As she said, my name is Ines, and I'm the Public Policy Coordinator at Fundación Alternativas. Uh, at Fundación Alternativas, we are a team that forms a think tank, which is the longest running and most consolidated um, progressive think tank in Spain. We are linked with researchers from all over Spain and international as well, especially in Latin America, and with progressive policy makers from different parties. And we were born in 1997, so we're 25 years old. And as a think tank, we're strongly focused on providing quality data to inform policy making in our country and in Europe. And we want to encourage the implementation of uh, proposals that have the potential to, in to improve our social web well being. Uh, we promote our research through seminars, webinars, public dialogue, debate, and through collaborating with other institutions as we do in this project. Uh, the Public Policy Lab is in charge of the media literacy uh, for democracy participation of the Fundación Alternativas, and we are a part of this project because of our strong interest in uh, misinformation and media literacy since they're so closely linked uh, to quality of democracy and also to democratic apathy, which are two of our main lines of action. For example, we make a report on the state of democracy in Spain every year, and uh, we have published studies on the impact of this information and how we perceive immigration in Europe before. During the project, we will be organizing a workshop for young journalists in our headquarters in Madrid, and we will also host a closing ceremony, and uh, as well as, of course, supporting every other activity coordinated by our colleagues from Bulgaria, Italy, Poland and Ireland. Um, closing up, uh, media distress, distrust uh, in Spain is quite high as compared to other European countries. And uh, we will make not far, no further reference to this, uh, although because our, it will be our colleague from the University of Rhein, another Spanish institution participating in this European project who will tackle this after me. And lastly, we want to thank our partners in this project for trusting us and for the excellent work they have already done and thank everyone, um, all the attendants uh, who are listening to us now and who are with us in this launching event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Inez. Um, and next I'm gonna pass you on to Dr. Maria Oxfat, um, our partner from Poland to introduce herself. Thank you so much, Sarah, um, for introduction. Uh, good morning, my name is Maria Ochwat and I represent the University of Szczecin. Uh, together with Professor Renata Podgórzańska and Professor Tomasz Tapiewski, we are conducting research on the problem of disinformation uh, in Poland. Um, it's a real honor um, and pleasure for us to participate in the project. Uh, 
In the project, we also organized other activities, seminars, conference. Uh, we also hope that you know it will result in more publication on this information in Poland. Uh, as far as we know, this information is a deliberate dissemination of false or misleading information aimed to undermining trust in institutions, societies, and specific groups. It has accompanied us since the beginning of humanity. Uh, however, the development of digital technologies, especially communication technologies, uh, has never before made it so easy to disseminate this kind of information, thus enabling it to influence the opinions and decision taken not only by individuals, but indeed by societies as a whole. These information activities are undertaken for a variety of reasons, uh, mainly to achieve political objectives or economic um, gain. Uh, this information is becoming an increasing threat to democracy, human rights, and society. This is also the case in Poland. Over the past few years, uh, we have witnessed disinformation campaigns on such socially crucial issues as the effectiveness of the COVID-19 um, vaccination, the harm to health of the fifth generation mobile network, or danger caused by migration crisis in 2015 and 2016. Uh, when we applied to the, to the grant, uh, we didn't know that the war in Ukraine will start and that we would have to deal with a great deal of disinformation about, among others, refugees from Ukraine. Despite widespread awareness of the negative consequences of this information, there is relatively little knowledge in Poland of what legal regulations are enforced in the European Union to combat it, what rules of responsibility have been established in this regard. Legal acts concerning this information problem are sometimes confused with uh, regulations aimed at combating other phenomena, like, for example, like hate speech. Many experts argue that in Poland, um, we haven't answered on a few crucial questions. The first one, what kind of threat this information is and how can we fight with it? Moreover, the same expert claim that uh, Poland hasn't done it because those in power don't want to do it. And what's more, the society is too passive to do it for them. At present, Poland lacks a single legal act uh, introducing legal measures to combat disinformation. Of course, uh, with regard to personal damage caused by such activities, we have the civil code. But when we talk about uh, uh, public damages, uh, we have only one law. Uh, it's related to election campaigns. The state still doesn't have the security strategy in the information space. Of course, we have a draft. The draft was prepared by National Security Office in 2015. The document indicates what this information is, the risk and threats associated with it, proposing objective and tasks. However, it's only a draft. The European Union has some experience in this area, as well as NATO. We should not only learn from their uh, experience, but also seek newer and more effective tools to combat dissemination. Thank you very much. Right, thank you very much, Maria. Um, and finally, I'm passing on to uh, Dr. Rahman Ruiz um, to introduce himself. Okay, thank you, Sarah, and good morning, everyone. For me, it's a huge pleasure to take part in this conference and in this project. I am a professor of philosophy of law and part of the group of the University of Hain in this research project, together with Lola Perjaraba, lecturer in philosophy of law, too. One of my main research topics has always been human rights, and currently I'm focused on analyzing the risk and threats that false news pose to some human rights and to democracy. This is an issue that Spanish citizens are very concerned about. In fact, according to some surveys, the Spanish are, together with the Portuguese, the Europeans who are most worried about this issue. To point out some data, the 83% 80, uh, of Spaniards declare that they often come across fake news on the internet. And one additional concern is that many of them present that sort of information in most cases, without knowing that it is false, but sometimes even knowingly. The result is that fake news, especially those related to politics, is often more widely distributed than, and reaches more people than true news. 
For, the, for this reason, the level of trust in the media has decreased in recent times in Spain. So although the traditional media, such as television, radio, and written press, still inspire a reasonable credibility, there is a great distrust toward the social networks, and especially towards applications such as WhatsApp. And this is very serious because about 19% of the surveyed people are firmed that they use at least occasionally the social networks to be informed. And this situation is even more worrying in the case of young people since they use social networks to a greater extent, which makes them the most vulnerable group when it comes to having a distorted vision of reality. In fact, according to a survey, 78% of young people between the ages of 16 and 24 don't know how to differentiate between false and true, and true news. For this reason, at the University of Jaén, given the close contact we have with young people, in addition to collaborate with the activities organized by the other partners, we have proposed carrying out an activity consisting of three workshops in which we'll analyze, analyze these issues and try to find solutions jointly between the students and the speakers who will represent three of the groups more related to the issue of false news. So in the first workshop, we will count with the collaboration of three university professors, experts in human rights, in the second with three journalists, and in the third one with three YouTubers who disseminate news and who are well known to a large part of the Spanish youth. With this activity, we hope to raise awareness among the public, and especially among young people, about the risk associated with this type of news as well as to provide them with some guidelines to distinguish as far as possible the false news from the true ones. And finally, to make them aware that the simple fact of sharing an unverified publication or image has an amplifying effect that is detrimental to democratic values. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ramon. Um, so we're moving on now to our, our external speakers who are addressed kind of different issues in the project. Um, and during this section in particular, I'll ask you to put any kind of questions you have um, as they come to you. And we'll try to get to as many questions at the end. Our first speaker is Marco Del, Ma Del Mastro. He's a social scientist, author of several books and scientific publications. He works with the Italian Communications Authority and has dealt with misinformation and disinformation for many years including through a number of uh, international projects. And today, Marco is going to give us a comprehensive approach to misinformation and disinformation. Um, so I'll pass you over to Marco now. I know he has Hi. Hi, Marco. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I start apologizing for the choice of the title. I mean, I guess that, uh, I mean, it's, it's a sort of nonsense uh, to speak uh, about a comprehensive approach in 10 minutes. And so it's... Uh, <laughs> Uh, but it's perfectly in line with the idea of uh, this information. So my the speech is to give uh, the, the idea is to give you uh, in ten minutes again a glimpse of the fact that this information it's a quite a complex phenomenon and uh, should be analyzed uh, in my opinion with a very comprehensive approach. So um, uh, I start to share my okay. Okay. I hope. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, um, uh, the idea is I start with this idea of uh, um, public sphere uh, of uh, Jürgen Habermas, which is, the, of course, the famous uh, uh, sociologist and uh, philosopher, German. The idea is that uh, if we want to talk about misinformation, we have to talk about uh, uh, public opinion, which is uh, discussed uh, in conversation and um, uh, about matters of general interest uh, uh, within a specific mean of communication and for uh, transmitting information. And in this speech, I will tackle three uh, steps. Uh, uh, we start with, uh, I mean, a sort of reality. I mean, um, and uh, even though, I mean, uh, I mean, we 
we we dis still discuss if there i mean there is a nice book of uh, um, very famous neurologists in in the us in which which is the case against the reality so suppose that there is a reality then there is a, a, a process of uh, called uh, new selection and um, so the filtering uh, we will see of uh, events by the the news media then uh, there's uh, agenda setting so choosing which uh, uh, of these news are um, more important th than the other and finally of course they go to the public mm, perception of people um, uh, i've just finished one year of uh, uh, sabbatical, so I will report to you some evidence on a, a study, uh, I, um, some studies I did with the, um, within a research pro the project with the university and other research centers. We concentrate on uh, uh, vaccine, of course, which is uh, quite a, such a relevant uh, uh, issue with opposing views, high polarization. We analyzed five, uh, six years from 2016 to 2021, uh, uh, which is a quite an important period, not only for COVID-19 vaccination, but before for the introduction in Italy of an uh, so design approval and enforcement of a new law on uh, pediatric uh, uh, vaccination. So we will study this with the data from social uh, media, social networks, surveys, and psychological experiments. So just to be very brief, as I said, there is a first uh, we, we, we uh, in some sense, uh, when we talk of this information, we always concentrate of the news narrative. But before this, of course, there is a process of uh, uh, news selection and uh, um, many instances of the bias can start from the, this uh, uh, gatekeeping process called in the so sociological literature. So uh, the fact that uh, the, the new the journalists of the news media can choose only some information and discard other. So this is a typical example is uh, uh, the Brexit. Uh, uh, lots of information was not, uh, was concentrated only on the cost of staying in Europe uh, during the Brexit referendum. And so it was much more a process of uh, selection bias than narrative bias. Uh, we, uh, in this picture, you see that uh, we classify, I mean, we, we analyze uh, in uh, six years almost all news media in, in Italy, more than uh, 700, and the classification is uh, between uh, questionable and reliable news sources. Of course, we take this, this classification from uh, independent third parties uh, fact checkers, such as uh, NewsGuard, Pagella Politica, and uh, uh, all the news outlet which lies on uh, the 45 degree line uh, uh, have have a balance uh, selection line, balance selection of uh, positive and adverse events on vaccination. If uh, one um, in the, a new source stay above the, this line, there is a sort of bias uh, uh, for uh, adverse events. If it's below, you, you have a bias uh, for uh, positive events. And as you see, there is a strong bias of questionable news sources for uh, uh, providing only events which are quite negative, adverse uh, on, on vaccination. So this is tell us that uh, in the first, uh, as a first thing that there is a, a selection bias very strong from uh, reality to uh, the news media. Uh, uh, discussion. Then uh, the, the, the second step is the agenda setting, again a very old concept in sociology, but uh, still very important. Uh, the agenda setting is of course the ability of the news media to influence the important place on some uh, news topics. And uh, again, we, 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 we tackle uh, the uh, evolution of the production of news content of vaccination between uh, questionable and reliable news sources. And as uh, you see from this 
chart, you see that uh, in the very first period in which there was this discussion on uh, the new law on vaccination, the percentage, the coverage of uh, the percentage of coverage of uh, reliable boots, uh, reliable uh, news media uh, on vaccination was really marginal. So all the void of, um, of course, uh, demand and uh, consumer and citizen demand was in some cell, uh, all this void was fulfilled by questionable uh, new sources. And then, of course, when with the outbreak of the pandemic, there is a, a, a different evolution with a more coverage of both questionable and reliable. We did some econometrics on this, some uh, hard econometric stuff uh, with uh, a, ca a causality analysis. Uh, Call effective transfer and entropy. Of course, if you want the paper, is is below in the, the, the in the slide. And we uh, we we we, we prove that in the first period, in the pre-pandemic era, the agenda was set by the questionable news sources on vaccine in Italy was set. And then, of course, with the outbreak of uh, a more coverage of uh, the new, the reliable mainstream news sources, uh, was, uh, uh, we, we, we found the opposite direction. This means that for many years, uh, uh, this, there was a, a very uh, big void of uh, um, news production on vaccine, and this one was fulfilled by questionable, um, by misinformation and disinformation. Uh, the last step is the beliefs of uh, citizens. Uh, here we is uh, a sort of uh, fake news on fake news. I mean, this, there is an idea from a very nice but misleading paper of Richard of Steder in 1974 that uh, who believe in conspiracy theory and disinformation is a sort of paranoid, has a paranoid, it's a modest minority of the population with a paranoid style. After uh, more, than uh, fifth, more than 50 years, and now we know that this is not true. Uh, belief in disinformation and conspiracy theory are quite widespread among the population, and this uh, Believed are really linked. We 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 run some experiment with uh, uh, cognitive psychologists. These beliefs are really linked to, of course, literacy, education, and again the way in which uh, people uh, got informed. So the number of uh, new sources they use, the reliability of them. Then you see from the chart that there is a huge difference in the probability of believing in false information or not. Another question, another issue is uh, also the psychological distress. So also our mood influences the probability of believing in information with a sort of syndemic, so uh, the co-evolution of not only of the pandemic of COVID-19, but also a new pandemic of depression. But this is, of course, is another issue. Uh, so just to end up with my presentation, uh, if we have to deal with uh, um, 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 with uh, um, misinformation, misinformation is really a very complex system. Uh, we have to analyze uh, selection of events, uh, of course, the narrative, the agenda setting, and then, of course, uh, how all these uh, influence the belief of the, the population. That's it. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you very much, Marco. And um, for that, we'll be able to take questions on that at the end. Um, next, I'm going to pass over to Dr. Jesus Ruiz Huerta, um, and he is going to speak on the harm of disinformation about migrants and asylum seekers across Europe. Um, Dr. Huerta is the Director of Public Policy, um, the Public Policy Laboratory at uh, Fundación Alternativas in Spain. He's a Professor of Applied Econo Economy at the University of Rey Juan Carlos and the author of many books and articles. I'll pass you over now to Jesus. Thank you very much. Good morning. This is not the first time that we collaborate with uh, the tax, uh, so it's a pleasure to be here. Yes, uh, immigration, uh, along with uh, climate change, are two of the main political economy concerns of Europe today. While Europe needs uh, labor to fill market demand, which uh, despite unemployment rates is unsatisfied to finance the welfare state, 
especially pensions and healthcare, uh, with new tax resources and to increase the figures of young population. A large number of EU member states have rejected the arrival of immigrants and asylum seekers to their territories. In addition, some political parties have anti-immigration programs that enjoy great success among some sectors in social networks and in terms of political votes. How to explain that situation? How is this general rejection of immigration built among different sectors of people? Caring about immigration management uh, seems justified, but how does the feeling of moral panic about immigration arise? How does it relate to misinformation? And what can we do to ensure that the debate on immigration management is fair and based on true facts. In 2017, Stanley Cohen coined the term moral panic to refer to those formed in a society as a result of migratory process. Uh, another, another minority groups. He also refers to the violence that is employed to fight against those problems and this perceived uh, threat, feelings of fear, suspicion, and irrational rejection arise from perceiving immigration as a threat. These feelings are based on misguided ideas, but have the real effect of denying an equal and fair treatment to immigrants. For example, when talking about moral panic in Europe, we can point out fear towards Muslim minorities. Much of the discourse and a good part of the votes received by anti-immigration political parties are based on the fear of Muslim people on the part of, of some groups who see them as a threat to their culture. Thus, Seeing a woman wearing an Islamic veil, a jihad, burqa, walking down the street or listening to a young man speaking an Arabic language in the subway raises for some feelings of suspicion, distrust, even fear that influence the way people think about immigration. It is evident that behind these attitudes, there is a serious problem of misinformation. Misinformation is what explains the rejection of immigration and the consideration of immigrants as a second class, uh, second class citizens. More than 50% of Spaniards believe that more aid is given to immigrants than to Spaniards in Spain, according to the Spanish Center for Sociological Research. Something not even remotely supported by the state budget. Why 60% of Europeans believe that immigration in the EU is excessive, according to a survey conducted by YouGov for several leading European newspapers. However, extra community immigrants represent only 8.2% of the population of the European Union. In the Canary Island, for instance, there was a strong opposition to the arrival of uh, few hundreds, uh, hundred immigrants coming from Africa, while the presence of millions of tourists on the, east, on the island is considered natural. There are frequent practices in media and social networks, new dynamics that might uh, seek to fuel this fear because it is lucrative or profitable. The most common misinformation practices in relation to immigration are the following offering disproportionate figures and real figures presented, presented in a confusing way, sharing, knowing or not, real lies and based information from questionable sources on social networks, presenting inaccurate uh, policy proposals that are not supported by the available data or even do not conf uh, conform to national law. Among the arguments that seek political benefit from moral panic, 
the most repeated in Spain is that immigrants abuse of social benefits or the most mediatized in France and widely used by international neocon movements is that an Islamization of Europe is taking pl place. It's kind of manipulated information, favors, emotions that tend to leg legitimize or justify the cluster of borders, sometimes at critical moments for the lives of, of, of potential uh, migrants, extraordinary control measures for certain uh, ethnic groups inside Europe, second class citizenship for migrants living in the European Union, even after they have obtained an European nationality. What can we do when faced by this situation? What to do to achieve the basis for quality political debate, one based on trustworthy information? One, from our view, it is essential to demand reliability in sources and high journalistic standards at all times and related to any topic and to avoid manipulation of data and news. So to not normalize a poor journalistic practice that make us all vulnerable and to bias based in disinformation. To thinking twice and reviewing the information we share before liking something online or sharing it. Three, appealing to the values of uh, European solidarity. This is the moral basis behind the European project, such as this one, or the Changing Minds Improving Citizens project. This project uh, tries to unite young people from Spain, Germany, and Romania in an international debate on non-EU immigration, inspired by deliberative democracy. The goal is to understand and avoid the stigmatization of immigration. Four, respond to misinformation with solid factual data. For example, we know that unemployment data would not improve in European Latin countries, at least if there were less immigration. There are a large number of job offers that are not being filled in our countries. This problem in the labor market work as fuel to spread the idea that immigrants steal jobs from the non-immigrant population. We need to recover the relevance of truth. Human dignity cannot be negotiable. We can end by quoting the Nobel Prize for Literature and Prince of Asturias Award for Letters Gunther Grass, when says, Europe will not manage to survive without immigration. We should not be so afraid of that. All great cultures have arisen from forms of cross-breeding. Breeding. That's all, thank you. Thank you very much, Jesus. Um, I'm now gonna pass you on to Dr. Ricardo Castellini da Silva. He's a media, media literacy educator with the uh, European Digital Media Observatory in Ireland. He also works in Dublin City University in the Institute for Future Media, Democracy and Society and the university's Anti-Bullying Research Center. Today, Ricardo is gonna to talk to us about the work of the European Digital Media Observatory and also about um, pedag pedagogical approaches to tackling disinformation. So I'll pass you over now uh, to Ricardo. Hi, Sarah. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Great. So, just make sure. Yeah, that's right. can that's see. We can see yeah. that. Great. Okay, so I'm just going to give um, a very brief overview about uh, Edible well, first. So, the European Digital Media Observatory. Uh, it started this year, 2023, uh, covering all the 27 EU member states plus Norway um, through 14 different hubs across the continent. And as you know, its main goal is to fight uh, disinformation. So this initiative basically brings together experts from different fields of studies, uh, such as fact checking, media literacy, journalism, uh, artificial intelligence, cyber security, and, and so on. And all of them 
are working together in collaboration with media organizations, with online platforms, the governments and universities to um, achieve this goal. Um, specifically in Ireland, uh, EDIMU is coordinated by the Institute for Future Media Democracy and Society based in, in Dublin City University. Uh, our partners here are Newsweep, which provides technological resources for detecting content, uh, the, University, the University of Sheffield, uh, which works with AI technologies for analyzing misinformation and disinformation and supporting fact checkers, and also the journal with its uh, fact-checking team. Um, and Fuji, of course, is, is responsible for research and analysis, and also for the media literacy initiatives um, in the country, which is the main topic that I want to, to discuss today. So very briefly, what we've been doing uh, here in Ireland, let me just set my screen here. So basically, um, we we have been you know looking for opportunities for media literacy initiatives across the country so for example we have delivered um, workshops on various topics around media literacy for both children and adults in public libraries. We have also designed and delivered uh, webinars on disinformation to secondary teachers in partnership with uh, government bodies. We have also been involved in development of classes on topics related to media literacy for students. So, for example, uh, last year we designed a new class on critical media literacy for students of the professional masters of education in Trinity College. Uh, these students, uh, for those who don't know, um, um, they will become secondary teachers in Ireland. So this is kind of a, a pre-service training for teachers. And this was the first class on media literacy uh, for PME students in the country. Um, also, we, um, we, we are responsible for organizing a new section on the New Media Literacy Ireland website. And I really recommend you uh, pay a visit to, to the website today. It's brand new. It was launched last year in December. Uh, and this section is called Training and Development. And it provides the public with resources and training courses on different topics related to media literacy, such as disinformation, uh, online safety, news media, um, um, data privacy, and, and so on. So the resources include websites, videos, lesson plans for teachers, uh, uh, and many other resources. So if you're looking for media literacy resources, I recommend you visit the Media Literacy Ireland website today and, and have a look. Um, and finally, we, we have a partnership. This is a, our national media literacy campaign for 2023. So we, we have a partnership with Media Literacy Ireland, as I mentioned, also U the University College of Dublin and the Local Government Manage Management Agency or LGMA. And we are basically developing a media literacy campaign for public libraries in the country. So the idea is to provide training to as many librarians as possible this year in 2023 and then launch a national campaign where we're going to invite people to go to their local libraries and learn more about media literacy with a special focus on fighting disinformation. Now in terms of the pedagogical approaches to fighting disinformation, so um, I think it is important to first to break this dichotomy between fake news and the media, uh, an idea that uh, Julian McDougall brilliantly discussed in one of his latest books. So as he put it, uh, this is a kind of a false binary uh, because fighting this information is not simply about teaching people, uh, you know, look, this is fake or this is real. Media literacy should not be about teaching people the difference between fake news and real news. It is about being inquisitive and resilient to all media forms. Uh, we can't forget that even authentic news is constructed. So basically, we need to discuss representation and tech uh, uh, and teach media representation. This is kind of in line with, with what uh, Marco was, dis was discussing a few minutes ago when he, he was talking about agenda setting and uh, um, uh, narrative bias versus selection bias and so on. So this means that if on the one hand, we have to value the work of journalists as curators of information in our society and promote professional journalism and good quality journalism and the mainstream media as good sources of information, 
We can't forget that we must also be critical towards all forms of media, including journalism, if it is necessary to do so in some cases, uh, um, of course. Um, and then, particularly in relation to this information, on top of digital technologies or digital technical skills, I think we need to understand that the media, uh, uh, as a part of a global system of dominance of capital, where many features of our experience online is monetized for profit. We all know that now. So big tech companies have an unparalleled amount of influence and power and concentrated power, I would say, which of course has a huge impact on matters such as free press uh, and free media in general. And this of course has to do with the business model of digital platforms. So uh, the so-called attention economy, uh, whereby the measure of success is the interest of the audience or users. So the disinformation crisis has a, an economic origin as well. And if we don't understand that, we are missing um, the point. And we also need to depart from an individual, uh, uh, actually, I mean, this leads me to, to, to the next topic. We, we, we also need to look at the structure and design of these platforms since they are designed to grab our attention and keep us connected uh, for the longest possible time. So we need to understand how algorithms work, for example, uh, um, and how they give us you know, this personalized experience, how they decide what we're gonna see, how they suggest uh, the contents for us. So even though tech giants, they pose usually as neutral platforms, in some situations, they might look more like uh, uh, powerful publishers that uh, uh, replaced uh, uh, editors, you know? Um, and of course, finally, we, and this is very important, we, and, and this has to do with the topic today, but more specifically media literacy and democracy, because we have to depart from this individual notion of media knowledge and skills uh, uh, to a collected one. And in this regard, I think the work of Professor, uh, Professor Paul Mihailidis has been particularly important in showing us that in order to tackle this information, we need not only be able to search for information online or interpret uh, a media message, but also engage in human connections, civil activism and participation. So it's important that we pay attention to the uses of media literacy. We can't forget that most of the, the so-called bad actors who create and spread this information are very skilled in, me, in, in the uses of media. So they can even be called media literate people. So it is not enough for people to acquire media literacy knowledge and skills. They also have to learn how to use this knowledge and skills to become active and responsible citizens who defend values such as justice, equity, um, tolerance, and of course, um, democracy. Uh, and finally, we also have to look at ourselves, uh, understand our mind and behavior. We have psychological traits that get in the way of a more objective analysis of the reality around us, such as the very popular confirmation bias. Uh, um, so the, cons the, the, the consumption of media is not, it's by no means purely uh, rational, and it requires us to be aware of that all the time. We cannot get rid of our confirmation bias, we, but we can certainly spot it, which is a very uh, good start. And just to show, I mean, some of the, the techniques that we use in our approach to, 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 to um, fight disinformation more specifically within the media literacy fields, uh, one of the strategies is to use um, uh, inoculation theory, which has become quite popular by now, I guess. Um, and it basically claims that if you expose people to the main techniques used by bad actors to create and spread this information, they will over time build some kind of immunity to these techniques and learn how to avoid uh, being deceived by them. Um, so yeah, that's it, thank you. Thank you very much for that, Ricardo. Um, and now on to our final panelist, Antonio Stango. Um, Antonio is an Italian political scient scientist. He's an expert of human rights at international le level. He's a writer and an editor. Um, he served um, as uh, a leading role in several non-governmental organizations, and he's currently the president of FIDU, the Italian Federation for Human Rights, who's the lead partner on this project. Um, Antonio today is going to cover in particular media literacy and human rights. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, thanks uh, to all uh, the great people that have been joining us today. Uh, I think uh, we uh, all are learning a lot from uh, this project. And uh, uh, I would like uh, just to say something that is uh, actually connected with uh, human rights. And, uh, and uh, why the Italian Federation for Human Rights decided to work on uh, this project. So this information actually affects uh, every field of uh, the life and uh, uh, especially in the last few years we have been uh, watching how uh, great events uh, all over the world have been somehow uh, affected exactly by this information i will speak about uh, two main issues one uh, that uh, happens almost one year ago and that is uh, the invasion on a large scale of uh, Ukraine, and uh, the other one that uh, already has been uh, enacted uh, since uh, three years ago, that there is uh, the COVID pandemic. So in both cases, we have been uh, watching a scientific work of disinformation by two authoritarian regimes. The Chinese one in the uh, fact of the COVID pandemic, and uh, the uh, Russian, the Kremlin one, for what concerns the uh, large scale invasion of uh, Ukraine. <laughs> Let's take uh, the, uh, the pandemic. So from uh, Beijing, uh, at the very beginning, they simply didn't give uh, any proper information. And so they allowed uh, the, the pandemic to spread out all over the world. Not only, they even controlled strictly the uh, World Organization for Health, the World Health Organization, WHO, not giving them the proper information and certainly maneuvering it in such a way that the WHO uh, at the, the beginning for several months was not in condition to understand uh, the phenomenon and uh, to uh, distribute uh, uh, information to other uh, scientific institutions all over the world. Then uh, they are even, uh, even arrived to the point uh, to silence uh, scientists, doctors in China who tried to explain how the situation actually was. So the manipulation of data, the censorship, the strict control of every information has been certainly one of the main uh, causes of uh, a pandemic that uh, uh, had a very high toll of victims all over the planet. And so fighting this information certainly uh, is extremely important to allow us to live uh, safely, to live in a better world. And this is uh, because of the authoritarian regime, typical policy. So just uh, not to say the truth. And uh, even, uh, I would say, uh, giving to the fabricated information the highest level of importance. So the official information becomes uh, this information. It is based just on logical basis. And that's the case of China, a very high population. We are speaking about uh, uh, 1 billion, 400 million people. And to keep under control uh, the reactions in other countries. Let's take now the, the case uh, of the large scale invasion of Ukrainian uh, that uh, started in uh, 2021, as uh, we everybody remember on 24 of February. So in, uh, in that case, the disinformation has been uh, very uh, wide. Uh, and I would like just to recall some point uh, of it, uh, some key points. For instance, uh, the uh, Kremlin, uh, propaganda said that Ukraine was a threat for Russia, while, uh, as we know, uh, never one Ukrainian soldier uh, entered the Russian territory. And uh, then uh, the, the disinformation said that, uh, uh, also on historical point of view, Crimea was also always Russian. What is, is not true. It is enough uh, to read carefully the history of Crimea, and we will understand uh, that this uh, was not the case. They said that in Kiev, uh, 
there is, according to them, a Nazi regime. What is absolutely not true. It is a, a evidently a, a normal um, system with all the problems of a government democratically elected, where even the president, by the way, is a, a Jew. So it would be extremely strange if he was a Nazi. Then uh, they started to say, you know, we are attacking Ukraine. Uh, and they even didn't say the word uh, war, as you know. They said it is uh, just a military operation because uh, they are satanist. And, uh, and can we imagine that uh, there is a government in Europe held by satanists? And then the patriarch uh, of the Russian Orthodox Church, that is a strict ally of, uh, of Mr. Putin, said, uh, you know, this Nazi regime organizes a, a gay pride in Kiev. Yes, it is paradoxical, but they even said this. So a lot of this kind of, uh, I, it is even difficult to say information, but uh, of sentences have been spread out in the last year about uh, Ukraine as a sort of uh, pretext or justification for the uh, wide-scale invasion. And uh, apparently, uh, we as uh, normally reading and listening uh, persons should be able to immediately identify that all uh, these uh, sentences, uh, all uh, these excuses are fake. But unfortunately, it is not these for many million people who just uh, uh, take the titles of uh, some news or they simply uh, tend to trust what uh, is uh, circulating uh, more. And that's why this project is uh, important. So we try to give all uh, people, starting uh, from uh, the youth, but uh, not only, some uh, tools to identify properly what is disinformation, what is misinformation, and how to contrast this. Uh, so the um, explanation of the experts that uh, we have been listening to today are important. The materials that we are going to produce about this uh, will be circulating uh, in uh, all the partner countries and at, in general, the European Union level. Uh, as for uh, misinformation, again, it will be very important to try and uh, suggest uh, to people how to identify information that are simply wrong, not because, like in the cases of uh, China and Russia, not because there is a an authoritarian government uh, that uh, um, spread out uh, the disinformation or fabricated fake news, but simply because, for instance, uh, the, the journalist or anyway, the person that maybe on the social media wrote something didn't take into consideration the reality of facts. So again, it is a very important to give tools, to give instruments, to understand what can be just a comment or an idea and what is a fact. So a grounded uh, element of the news. And, uh, and this is something that uh, we are going uh, to study and uh, to propose. So identifying tool for this, proposing how to enact our uh, campaign and enabling people, youth, and not only to to be owner of the news that uh, we read or we are listening to. So thank you very much for your attention. That's great. Thank you very much, Antonio. Um, so that was the final of our four speakers today. Um, and we have time for a few questions and answers. Um, and I'm going to take a few questions that we've had put in the chat so far. Um, so the first question I'm going to ask is actually kind of merging two people's questions. Uh, firstly, Ronan Kennedy from the Irish uh, Council for Civil Liberties in Ireland and Philip Ryan from UCD. So um, both people kind of touched on this idea of balancing um, the need for addressing disinformation with freedom of expression. Um, 
just to ask the the full panel and our partners has this ever been a concern or do you have any thoughts on how to strike that balance is this an issue and how to go about it that tension between disinformation and freedom of expression well if i may start i would say this is one of the the main issues that we have nowadays uh, um, because it's really difficult to to discuss the limits of what we can say you know um, and this is not a new issue actually we have always been talking about um, freedom of expression and and what are the limits about what we say so we'll have people who are more libertarian and they will say well you you should be able to say whatever you want and any action against you should be taken afterwards so if you do something harmful uh, you're going to pay for this but never before you say after you say it uh, and some people say well no, no it's better if you have some kind of regulation uh, personally i believe that it's better to have some kind of regulation just like we have in society i mean we live in a society with laws with uh, rules you know we cannot do whatever we want uh, and i think this is good to keep society working so in the same way I think in, in the online space, we should have some rules as well. The problem, Sarah, is to define this line yeah. because mm -hmm. some things that are, are obvious that you cannot say or that are, they are obvious that you can say, but some things are in that gray area where you go, okay, uh, I'm not sure if this is appropriate to say, or of course, if, you, if you're telling lies, we're talking about this information here mainly. So if you're, if you're telling lies about people, this should, this should not be allowed. But if you're making a comment that might imply something then people will say well i'm not sure if this should be regulated or not so yes uh, uh, but i think the main the main point is we have to put this on the table and discuss this uh, i think someone put here on the chat about uh del deliberative um uh meetings yes. uh, which is something that we've been talking about. i mean this this kind of things are important we have to put on the table and bring people the society to discuss not only experts in media literacy or regulators i mean the civil society has to participate and we have to you know uh, gather all these opinions and come to a common kind of common sense about that yes yeah. in, in, in general okay in general terms i would like to say that uh, perhaps it is as a uh, infrastructure, infrastructure uh, of the of this problem and looking for a good solution to assure uh, good data uh, in, in general in general terms uh, to to confirm that they are we have uh, uh, improved a lot about the, the the knowledge of the of the information in the different fields but uh, we must uh, do a lot of work uh, as well in this field so first dispose of good data second one good explanations uh, are these data used uh, adequately or are use uh, uh, based uh, or how can we confirm can, how can we control this and the third one is the the control of the whole thing on evaluation uh, even the accountability and so probably is necessary and I, I uh, agree with this last um, view about regulation. I think that there are some regulation is necessary to avoid the mi misinformation uh, as far as uh, it would be possible. Right, does anyone else want to come in on that? Can I add something? Yes. I, think I perfectly agree. Uh, with Ricardo and Jesus. Uh, however, I'm, we are extremely concerned about uh, this uh, issue. Um, and uh, obviously, it's extremely important to defend uh, freedom of expression, as I, I said before. And uh, I think that uh, we can defend our freedom of opinion and freedom of expression of tackling this information. Because as a human rights defender, we know that uh, many times authoritarian regimes use this information campaign to uh, undermine international law. So we should distinguish. International law, for example, are fact. They are not opinions. So if something uh, um, is, um, uh, if uh, someone uh, spread uh, opinions which are uh, different from what international law say. So in that case, this is a clear uh, goal from 
those who are spreading these disinformation campaigns uh, with a specific uh, objective to uh, confuse um, public opinion. And I'm saying this because uh, we uh, work a lot uh, to protect human rights, uh, to protect political prisoners, uh, and uh, we know how authoritarian regimes work. So this is absolutely important to uh, understand that there is the truth of the international law, and we should defend this truth. And then I think, I'm sure that the, if we become stronger uh, in defending our law, our rule of law, then we'll be also uh, strong to defend uh, our uh, freedom of press, our freedom of thought, and uh, our freedom of opinions. All right, thank you very much, Eleonora. Um, another question came through, um, which I thought was interesting, about um, the need to support kind of high standards in mainstream media. So I think Ricardo touched on that as well, about kind of demanding, but also supporting mainstream media in, to have high standards. Um, that question came in from Stephen McCafferty in the Social Change Initiative in Northern Ireland. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to comment on kind of the role of mainstream media or what kind of materials or support they need or what can we kind of demand of them? Uh, can I say something about regulation? The, yes, the, the, the yeah, first okay. question about the regulation. I totally agree with Ricardo. And so uh, there are also different uh, uh, philosophy behind uh, uh, different regulation. I mean, US uh, in kind of intervention is quite different from the European kind of intervention. But uh, there is a more trivial question since I have been uh, working in. in uh, antitrust and now regulatory authority for many times. Sometimes we have to ask if some regulation it is feasible or not. Because uh, I mean, when do you go, you come to define a regulation, then sometimes uh, uh, even if theoretically it could be, you, you, you can find a balance between freedom of expression and uh, sort of, but sometimes it's unfeasible then to, uh, uh, regulate uh, and tend to monitor and um, above all to, uh, to, 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 to do strict regulation on, on that kind of, uh, and this is, I mean, in some sense, uh, uh, I see many times and increasingly this uh, difference between uh, objective uh, aims of the, also in Europe, and then uh, effective uh, regulation affecting. So, so if I think uh, about privacy, in my opinion, it's, which is of course a very different, but I mean, it's really a concern for all of us, but then it's, we, we, we stand, uh, we fix uh, very high standards, but then in practice, we, we, we don't, uh, uh, we, we are not able because it's so difficult to uh, define a regulation which is quite feasible and to defend our privacy. So, so it's <laughs> regulation, it's, it's, you have to, in some sense, to, uh, to, to, to work with your hands and uh, to dirt your hands. Uh, <laughs> it's really, really difficult. Yeah, I, I was. Sorry, yeah. Now I would say that there's um, there's another thing you, you touched on, Sarah, when when you say about how you know in terms of funding, for example, for journalism. I mean, uh, so we know that the business model has changed because of the tech companies. So they lost a lot of revenue. I mean, they lost a lot of advertising, and now we have this more complicated thing that a, a lot of news are being accessed on social media platforms. And we know how this works. I mean, so people just, you know, they want to click. So the more clicks you have, the more yeah. money you get. So then this changes completely the, the idea of how the nature of journalism actually functions. Because, you know, now what we are seeing is that some mainstream media who are kind of, you know, trustable sources of, of information, sometimes you see headlines that are just clickbait because they want people yeah, just to yeah. click and, and access yeah. their content. So again, I, mean, I, I think funding is, is something really important. Uh, I don't have a solution for that, I'm sorry. I don't know, I, I think this could be, this could come from government in some part, could come from you know, uh, neutral agencies yeah. and whatever, but we definitely need 
to think about how good quality journalism will be funded uh, from now on. Thank you. That's yeah, Ricardo, that's a really interesting point about the funding model of journalism now that it's kind of a price per click model. So you are driven to say something more, maybe more extreme, even if you're in a mainstream kind of publication as well. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to come in on that point about mainstream media. So we just, one more question I'd like to put to people. Um, it came in from Cormac McKay kind of early in the chat and it was kind of ways you think of really kind of having constructive ways of engaging citizens in democracy and kind of information about democratic processes. Um, what are kind of effective ways of doing that? I know in the early stages of the project and in our last project um, that we worked with FIDO, uh, EU, uh, EU communication project, it was kind of that it's really important to have uh, people to be very informed and knowledgeable um, about democratic processes to kind of guard against disinformation. So does anyone from the panel or from the consortium have any comments on that? Like what are constructive ways of engaging citizens in democratic processes and information? I'm about democratic uh, processes. Well, I can actually say something concerning the engagement and the participation. As uh, we have uh, pointed out in the booklet, now it's um, a bit more easier to, to engage young people and citizens in, in participation and in democratic processes. And actually the commission and the institutions try to work on this extensively by creating civil dialogues on different topics in different cities, by uh, providing uh, open debates on round tables and so on. So it's, um, it's, it's actually a very nice way to uh, present to young people or those that do not have enough information concerning political processes how the institutions work and how these decisions are being taken and how their voice could be further heard uh, in these processes. Okay. Let, me, let me give a, an, an easy answer to your question. Okay. I, think, I think that uh, education is, is uh, very important in the different levels no? No, for children and for for young people, no? I am a teach. I'm teaching in a in a master of a, a journalist, economic journalism, no? and I try to do my best by trying that uh, people use adequately and explain adequately the work that they do and what are the sources that they uh, use in their in their works, trying to. Uh, improve their, 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 their work and uh, asking for more honesty and more clarity and more accuracy. You know? I think that it's, uh, it's a matter of time and I think it's very important. Thank if you. I may just compliment that uh, in terms of education because I am a media educator and I think um, to engage people with democratic values and, and all that justice and everything the first thing that sometimes we forget is that we have to understand people's context. We have to understand what is important for them. Sometimes we we just come with our values and the way we teach and the, the things that we think are important and we just want them to accept that. And I think we should turn this around. I think we, we should understand, you know, even in a country like Ireland, which is a small country, 5 million people, we have many different contexts. People need different things. Democracy means different things for them. Some people don't even have access to technology. And then we want to teach them about multimodal forms of communication, but they don't even have access to that. So first we need to understand people's context, what they need, and then you know it's it's going to be much easier to engage them in democratic values and and you know um, all these all these values that we we favor in society in some way. Great, thank you very much, Ricardo, and and to all our panelists. Um, we're just going to wrap up now, so we can kind of get you out of here by half past. Um, so just to thank you all for coming, thank you to all of our panelists, to Jesus, to Marco, uh, to Ricardo, um. And to, sorry, <laughs> Ricardo and Antonio um, and all of our partners who spoke today as well. Um, at the end of today, we will follow up with an email where I will share with you the materials from today. So the, the document 
that Maria showed. If it's okay with Marco and Ricardo, I will also share their presentations, um, if that's okay with both of you. Um, also, we will, in the coming months, be holding focus groups and workshops in our kind of respective countries as well. Um, so we'll get in touch with you about them, and as well as a survey um, run through the SERV program of the EU. Um, so all that's kind of left today is to just really thank you for coming and for your participation. Um, it is kind of the launch of our project, so we're just kind of kicking it off, and it's really um, really kind of encouraging to see so much engagement and so much interest in this topic at this time. So just thank you again. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. James. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye.